Hello, thank you all for joining us for our third Ship It event. Uh, this is our virtual event series where we get together and nerd out over the tech that we love right now with conferences being canceled and postponed. We miss all those vital connections that we make with people in person. Uh, community is important to us at Shopify and we really want to find a way to connect in this virtual space with you. My name's Anita Clark. I'm the managing editor of Shopify's engineering blog and sometimes the voice behind most of the Shopify Twitter. Today we're here with Dr. Chris Seaton. Uh, sorry, Chris, because I just love saying Dr. Chris Seaton. Uh, not only is Chris a doctor and an owner of various other letters, he is, dare I say, the father of Truffle Ruby. Um, Chris, thank you for being here. Thanks. Oh, I should move our things along here, shouldn't I? So uh, Chris is going to start with his presentation, and I'm going to get out of here while you guys listen. Thanks very much. So I work in the, the Ruby and Rails teams at Shopify. Um, this is where we support the foundational tools that Shopify is built on, and that includes improving them both for ourselves and also improving them for the rest of the community and improving them for the long term. I'm doing research on optimizing Ruby by compiling it just in time to machine code using Truffle Ruby, which is a project that Shopify works on in collaboration with Oracle and other companies. Today, I want to talk to you about a data structure used in Truffle Ruby called a sea of nodes graph. You may be aware that a compiler uses a data structure called an abstract syntax tree or an AST when it passes your program. You may not be aware that an AST is normally used just at the very front end of the compiler, just as it starts. And a compiler normally uses a different data structure to optimize your program and translate it into machine code in what we call the, the middle and the back end of the compiler. These are usually far more important than the AST um, because they're used for much more of the, the compilation time and they're used where we're doing the important optimizations. The data structure we're using in Truffle Ruby to compile Ruby is this sea of nodes graph. Um, and it comes from the Graal compiler that's part of the Graal VM project at Oracle Labs. I want to show you what this data structure looks like and how it works. And I think it's worth doing that for a wider audience for two reasons. First of all, I just think it's a really interesting and beautiful little data structure, uh, but it's also a practical one. There's lots of pressure to learn about data structures and algorithms in order to pass, for example, coding interviews in our industry. And it's nice to show something that's really practical that we're applying here at Shopify and Oracle. Also, the graphs in CA nodes are just really visually appealing to me and I wanted to share them because I think they look cool. Secondly, knowing just a little bit about this data structure can give you some pretty deep insights into what your program really means and how the compiler really understands it, which can sometimes be different to how it looks as textual source code. So I think looking at these graphs can level up your understanding of software a bit. Now we use Ruby at Shopify. That's the main program language we use for all our applications. Um, but I should tell you at this point, I'm afraid that I'm actually gonna be using Java to show my examples. Uh, this is because compared to Ruby, Java has much simpler semantics and so much simpler compiler graphs. For example, if you index an array in Java, that's pretty much all there is to it, indexing. Um, but if you index an array in Ruby, you could have a, a positive index or a negative index. You could use a range. There could be conversion, coercion, lots more involved. It's more complicated and Java is semantically a lot simpler. But don't worry, it's all super basic Java code. So you can just pretend it's pseudo code if you want to. Um, so if you don't know anything about Java, you can just look at it and squint and pretend it's Ruby and it'll all be fine. In some future blog posts, I'm gonna go into some more depth about how this directly applies to Ruby rather than using Java to keep it simpler. So let's jump straight in by showing um, some example code and then we'll show this data structure that I'm talking about. So here's a method. Um, in Java, as I said, it's not using any advanced Java features. So you can just pretend it's pseudocode if you want to, and hopefully most people will understand it. It returns the nth Fibonacci number using the naive recursive approach. So we have a method called fib, it takes a parameter n, and if n is less than or equal to one, then return n, else return calling fib again with n minus one plus fib n minus two. Here's the traditional abstract syntax tree or AST data structure for the program. So if you know a tiny bit about compilers, you might've seen this sort of data structure before. Uh, it's a tree and it directly maps to the, the, uh, the textual source code. 
So it doesn't add much and it doesn't remove much. Uh, to run it, you'd follow one path in the tree from the root at the top to the leaves at the bottom. So we have uh, we have an if, um, and then we say less than or equal to n and one, and then depending on which whether that's true or false, we either take this root or take this root, and then we we add together the result of calling fib, and to call it we do minus n etc. And here's the C of nodes graph for that same program. This is the data structure that is the subject of this talk. There's quite a lot going on here, but I'll break it down. So we've got boxes and arrows. So it's basically a flowchart. The, the boxes are operations and the arrows are connections between operations. And an operation can only run after all the operations with arrows going into it have already run, like a flowchart. A really important concept is that there's two main kind of arrows here that are very different. The fatter red arrows show you how control flows in your program. The thinner green arrows show you how the data flows in your program. And the, the black hashed arrows are meta information. There are also two major kinds of boxes for operations. So the, the rectangular red boxes do something. They have a side effect. So red for a sort of irreversible uh, major action. And the green ovals and diamonds uh, compute something. They're pure, they're side effect free. So green for safe to execute whenever we want. You start at the top with the, the start node and you run the program in your head by moving down the red arrows towards one of the return boxes at the bottom. If your red box has arrows into it from a green box, then you must have run that green box and any other green boxes pointing into it first. So if we want to run this call to Fibonacci, then we need the, the value computed from doing this add operation from a parameter and a constant value. And then we can trace a path through the program uh, doing it. Here's one major thing that I think is really great about this data structure. The red parts are an imperative program and the green parts are like mini functional programs. We've separated the two out of the single Java program and this will get really useful later on. I said that I think we can learn some insights about your program using these graphs and here's what I mean by that. When you write a program in text, you're writing in a linear format that implies lots of things that aren't really there. When we get the program into a graph format, we can encode only the actual precise rules of the language and relax everything else so we can see what really matters and, and forget about what doesn't. And that's a bit abstract, so here's a concrete example. Here's another example program. And this one's a, a three-way if statement and it does some arithmetic. So we have uh, parameters n, a, b, and c. And if n is greater than zero, then we do a plus b times c. Uh, if n is less than zero, we do a minus b times c, otherwise we return a. Now notice that b times c is common to two of the branches, but, uh, but not for the third branch. So we're writing that logic twice in the program, um, and it's used in, in two places. When we look at the graph for this, we can see a really clear division between the imperative parts of the program, uh, those are the thick bits in red, and the functional parts, those are the, the thinner bits in green. And notice in the particular, there's only one multiplication operation. The value of A times B, sorry, B times C, is the same on whichever branch you compute it. So we have just one value node in the graph to compute it. It doesn't matter it appeared twice in the textual source code, that's been forgotten about because it does the same thing. It only appears once now. Also, notice the multiplication node doesn't belong to either the branches. It's just sort of floating off here on its own as a little uh, pure functional program. Um, and then it's called in, the result of that multiplication is called in where it's needed. When you, run the, when you look at the, the program source code, you think that you pick a branch and only then would you execute B times C. But looking at the graph, we can see that the, the computation B times C is really free from whichever branch you pick. You could run it before the branch if you wanted to and then just ignore it on the branch where it isn't needed. And maybe doing that produces smaller machine code because you only have to have the code for the multiplication once. 
And maybe it's faster to do the multiplication before the branch because processors can do multiple things at the same time. So it could be doing your multiplication while it's working out which branch it wants to go to. As long as the multiplication nodes result is ready when we need it, then we're free to put it wherever we want. Uh, one of the tools we've been developing at Shopify is something to query this graph and show us where we think the multiply is likely to be run. Um, the compiler does this for its own purposes internally, but this tool lets us visualize that. So this version of the graph here has the, adds these extra orange arrows that attach pure functional nodes for where we think the computation needs to be done or could be done because there's often multiple options. In this case, it shows us that the, it will run the, the multiplication before the branch. The result isn't needed if they take the branch that doesn't need it, but that's not a problem because it's a pure operation. We said it was functional, it's safe to run whenever. This kind of freedom is impossible in the AST where everything's fixed in place. It's only possible when we blur away the text and get to that pure meaning of the program. You may have heard of optimizations like common sub-expression sub sub -expression elimination that deduplicates code, and we're getting that for free here in the graph. And also consider something like dead code elimination as another example. If a graph has, if a node has no edge using it because if nothing's done with the result, then it's dead code and it just isn't part of the graph anymore and it disappears. Here's another example. This one has a loop this time. So it loops um, from zero to N and then it adds an adds uh, a value A to an accumulator X each time it goes around the loop. So what we have now is we have a, a large thick back arrow and this is the only arrow which goes back up in the control flow. So that's what makes it a loop. And you can see there's a, a loop of red arrows now forming this loop here. This program's written in an imperative way with that loop. But if we look at a, but if we look at a little isolated functional part of it, we can clearly see the repeated addition on its own. So if we zoom in on this part of the graph here, we can see there's literally a little loop defining the fact that we add a value onto itself repeatedly in a loop without seeing the, the imperative control phone. This node here, with the, the circle with the line for it, that's called a phi node. It's a Greek letter phi. Um, it's got historical reasons why it's named that, but you can think of it as meaning just the value changes around this point. As I said, we're really using Ruby at Shopify, not Java. Um, and I'll show you uh, an example of what a, a real Ruby graph looks like. Um, it's much more complex. So if we write Fibonacci um, and then get the graph for that, um, then we're now looking at this much more complicated graph. Um, this is why I didn't use it for these simple examples. But all the graphs I've shown you, including this one, are the real graphs as the compiler really understands it. They're not um, synthesized examples. If you if you run the Gural compiler with debug information to, to dump this out, this is the actual graphs you get. Um, I'll zoom in here on this, this Ruby graph. Um, and you can see an example of the extra complexity here. What's on the screen here is just the nodes involved in doing the uh, the add operation. So in Java, when you add together two integers, it's a, a machine style add. Whereas in Ruby, we have to check for overflow. So we have extra logic in nodes here for adding exact, which means to check for overflows. Um, and then we have to guard if that's happened and so on. So that's why Ruby is, is more complicated. And why we use Java to show simpler examples. Every few years, someone writes a new PhD thesis on how we should all be programming graphically instead of using text. And I think you can see the potential benefits and the practical drawbacks of doing that by looking at these graphs. Uh, one benefit is you're free to reshape, restructure, and optimize your program by manipulating the graph. Um, as long as you maintain a set of rules, the rules for the language we're compiling or its semantics, you can do whatever you want. Um, a drawback though is it's not exactly compact. Um, so this was a, a six line method and that's pretty small of a method, but it's a, a full screen to draw it as a graph really. And it already has 21 nodes and 22 arrows in it. Um, as we get bigger graphs, it becomes impossible to draw them really without the arrows starting to cross over each other. And the arrows become so long that they have no context. You can't see where they're going to or where they're coming from. 
and then it becomes much harder to understand. So it doesn't really scale uh, much up beyond this. At Shopify, we're working on ways to understand these graphs at Shopify's scale. Um, the graphs for idiomatic Ruby code in a production code base like Shopify's can get very large and very complicated. Uh, one tool that we're writing to understand these um, graphs is the tool I've been showing you that has drawn these illustrations. Um, we're also working on a tool to decompile the graphs back to Ruby code so we can understand how Ruby code is being optimized by printing the optimized Ruby code um, back out of the compiler. And this means that just the developers who just know Ruby can use Ruby to help understand how their code is being compiled. Uh, we wouldn't expect all developers to do that, but if you're looking at some inner loop sort of operation, you might want to do that. Um, so in summary, this sea of nodes graph data structure um, allows us to represent a program in a way that relaxes what doesn't matter and allows us to restructure the program to make it more efficient uh, while just enforcing the rules that do matter. You may think of your program as being a linear sequence of instructions when you write it as textual source code, but really your compiler is able to see through that and it sees something simpler and more pure. Um, and in Truffle Ruby via Graal, it does that using this C of nodes data structure. They're an interesting way to look at your program, and I, I think that may be novel to, to many people who have just heard an AST before. Um, we use these graphs for Ruby, but they're much more complicated, and that represents the extra complexity of Ruby's semantics. So that's why I've used Java here. So that's all for me about C of nodes graphs in Truffle Ruby and why I think they're they're cool and what we think we can learn from them. Anita. Thanks. I always forget to put this thing back up, but uh, thank you, Chris. Um, uh, just to kick continue talking about Ruby and the graphs. Um, is there a tool that makes it easier for people to consume the graphs when they look at it? Because obviously they're pretty big. Um, is there a way for them to like just focus on the parts that they really need to consider doing in their in the particular task that they're doing at that time? Yeah, so Oracle use an interactive tool um, called the Ideal Graph Visualizer that allows you to scroll around and it allows you to collapse different parts of the graph. So you can say, I'm not interested in this branch over here. I'd like to collapse it uh, and not have to look at it. Um, but they're still very complicated to do with that. At Shopify, we're looking at some ideas for recognizing idiomatic patterns that appear regularly and then saying, well, represent that little pattern of nodes as one node until you need to understand what's going on inside it. So you can have a, a higher level view and then dig down into it if you want to know more details. Uh, and that's the way to do it, I think, to, to scale it. So start with something that hides the detail and then let you dig down the detail if you want to. Awesome. Um, I'm going to go with uh, Dennis' question. Uh, and he's asking, or she, sorry, uh, how did you plot that color, the colorful pictures? And um, I'm assuming. Did you have the to? Graphs, yeah. yeah. Did you color them yourselves, or does the the tool do that for you? So the compiler dumps out the graph in a binary format, and we've written a tool that reads that binary format, and it will draw these graphs using something called um, GraphViz, which is an existing open source project. And we do some heuristics and some sort of we apply some high level understanding of what the graph really means in order to draw it in a slightly better way. And we do some things like we constrain which arrows are more important, and that helps graph is laid out in a better way. And then it outputs an SVG or a PDF or a PNG you can use. Great. Um, Marcin asks, is the graph drawing tool a full art alternative to IGV? Where can I get it? So it's not interactive. It, um, it's a command line tool. But in some ways, I think that's better because you can sort of use, the, use like command line to sort of iteratively understand the graph. It's not open source yet, but I, I hope to open source at some point. Um, I know Martin, so um, he can reach out to me and I'll uh, I'll let him have early access to it. Oh, that's cool. Um, Mazami, and I'm sorry if I've mispronounced your name. Uh, can we ask, can we generate tests from graphs and which see which parts of the code are covered when they run? So testing the graphs is really interesting because of um, when we're developing these um, highly optimizing compilers, how do we check they're doing the right thing? So you think I'll implement an optimization to do something. How do we know that's worked and how do we know it keeps working? Um, one way to do it is to run the compiler until the graphs are generated 
and then examine the graphs to check there in the format that you'd like. And, and sometimes we do test Truff Ruby like that um, and Oracle test Grow like that as well. And they look at the output, the graphs. Um, if you're looking for it to test um, which parts of your code are run, like a, cov like a, a coverage system, um, then uh, yeah, you can use it for that as well. You can add extra information to say, check this, this node has been used and that sort of thing. Awesome. Um, Dennis asks again, what are the, what about what is about the performance of Truffle Ruby? How is it compared to Ruby compiler? So that's a, a complicated question. We've been working on Truffle Ruby for a long time. Sometimes for um, isolated, um, smaller parts of code, but still production code, it runs ten times faster, fifteen times faster. So if you do something like render a liquid template, it can be that much faster. We're still working on making whole applications um, as fast as we'd like. Um, and that's, again, it's a problem of scale because on real applications, there's so much code involved, it's hard to understand how to optimize them um, in a good way. Um, but Truffle Ruby can run real production Ruby code 10 times faster. We, we, do, we do fairly regularly see that. Great. Um, Alan asks, what are some ways to deal with big graphs? We need to, need to cut away what does and doesn't matter, but it's quite hard to figure out what does and doesn't matter. Um, so what I usually do is I try to write a simpler program in the first place. So if I see some behavior optimizing as I'd like or not optimizing as I'd like, what I try to do is write a simpler test case in the first place and keep writing it simpler until I get just the, the logic I'm interested in. Um, you can also search these graphs. So what I'll often do is I'll add in some arithmetic that uses a constant value and then use some unusual number. And then I'll search the graph for that unusual number. Um, and then I'll find it where it is in the source in the graph and therefore helps me sort of navigate what's going on. And the, the graphs do include source information, but it's sometimes a bit confusing to work with because of by the time it's gotten into the compiler this far, some of that information has been sort of obfuscated and, and confused a bit. So it's difficult to relate it back to the source code. Because as we said, right, the we only had one multiplication operation for the two that appeared in the source code. So if you ask me, where does that node come from in the source code? Well, it comes from two places at the same time, right? So it's not as simple as mapping it back one-to-one -to, -one to the source code, which is why they're powerful, but it's also why they're hard to work with. Thank you. Uh, Kevin asks, how does the graph handle DOP when methods are overridden? Are there always multiple paths for the graph in this case, for this case? So one of the things that we do to simplify the graph, uh, simplify the graph when we draw it is we remove the meta information. Um, in reality, there's lots of extra nodes I didn't show that maintain meta information about the program. Um, I've got in the, there's two blog posts I referenced, and in the second one, um, it tells you about something called frame states, which is this meta information. Um, and that means that we can relate certain points in the program back to source code. When you de-optimize, you go and look for the latest um, piece of meta information, and then you go to that point in the program. Um, so one of the things we've done to make them more understandable is remove that meta information. Great. Thank you. Um, oh, OK. I, I... Don't even want to attempt to butcher your name. I'm sorry. Uh, what infra do you suggest to handle approximately a thousand RPM with Truffle Ruby on Rails? Average response time being under 200 milliseconds. I'm afraid it's too early. 200 milliseconds. Sorry, not I'm under. I'm afraid it's probably just still too early to answer that kind of um, question. Uh, we're not we're not running a large application um, at scale with good performance yet to be able to measure that kind of thing so i can't answer that yet sorry we don't know is that something that uh maybe you'll know after you've dealt with our big monolith for a while yeah so so what i'm doing at shopify is i'm i'm trying to run a, a large production application on top of the trough ruby and then when we have that working well we'll be able to answer these questions so shopify is absolutely pushing forward that goal of trying to answer that question in general for Truffle Ruby of how fast can it be on a, a real entire application. Can you go into more detail about the work that you're doing um, at Shop and, and what it means to help uh, push Truffle Ruby forward? 
Yeah, so I'm, I'm collaborating on an open source project. It's primarily worked on Oracle. So Truffle Ruby um, comes from Oracle, and I work on Truffle Ruby in collaboration with the the other developers at Oracle and other places um, using an open development methodology. Um, Shopify does this for many major projects which matter to us. So we have people who work on the open source Ruby implementation, the standard one, um, people who work on Rails, and they, they contribute like anyone else would um, in the open, creating pull requests, um, testing things. And one of the great things about Shopify is we can, we can test ideas on Ruby at a really large scale because we have such a, a large scale deployment. Um, if we think something could work well for Ruby, we can we can test that out quite easily, and that's a quite a unique capability of Shopify. Thanks, um, Jenny asks, how much does Truffle Ruby help you save on infrastructure costs? If you can quantify that, I can for the same reason I can't answer that like, quantitatively, but I can I can tell you where the benefits may be. So Truffle Ruby aims to run code in less time, so it's we hope it will reduce your latency, your, your time for each customer to get a result. Chuff Ruby has much more advanced memory management than standard implementations of Ruby. Um, and this means that we, we hope it will have less memory per request. Uh, the caveat to that is there's likely to be quite a large initial memory investment. So you have to pay quite a lot of memory to get it running. But then each user on top of it, each concurrent request you're handling, should use less memory. And that's because we have better garbage collectors. Uh, we can remove the allocation of objects. So you, you're allocating objects, but it doesn't really go on the heap. It doesn't really get garbage collected. It's done in a sort of ethereal way. Um, uh, so we hope that it'll also reduce uh, memory per request as well. So Truffle Ruby is trying to reduce the cost of running Ruby applications um, and improve the results for your customers in, in multiple ways. Thanks. Um, and our next question is, uh, can we generate code given a graph? So that's one of the things we're working on at Shopify. Um, an alternative to looking at the graphs and trying to understand them that way is to run the compilation process in reverse and to take a graph that's perhaps been optimized and turn it back into Ruby code and then read it as Ruby code. And that way we don't have to teach anyone about graphs. We can simply say, this was your Ruby code going into the compiler, and then this is your Ruby code coming out of the compiler. And people can see that way, was this method in line? Was this multiply run once or twice? Um, is this object being garbage collected? They can see things like that just by reading the, the Ruby code, which we think will make it easier. Um, next question is uh, about if Shopify is using Truffle Ruby for um, their iOS API. Not yet. The The thing we're experimenting with Truffle Ruby is on the storefront renderer. That's the, the application at Shopify that handles uh, most common requests for someone visiting uh, one of our merchant stores. So that's what we really want to give out a great quick result for is showing someone the storefront when they turn up. And that's what we're experimenting with um, at the moment before we try it on anything else. Um, can you can you share any details of how it's going or any so novel we can things run, that you've discovered? We can run storefront renderer. And that wasn't a given because of, this is the first time I think anyone's run any kind of major production application on Truff Ruby, And it works. Truff Ruby runs it in exactly the same configuration as MRI. Um, I think maybe one or two little caveats where we swap a version of a gem or something like that. Um, but it's using the same C extensions as standard Ruby does. It uses the same configuration more or less, um, and it runs on Trough Ruby um, correctly. It doesn't run very fast yet, but we're working on that. Great. Um, another question we have is, what is a simple tool to produce ASTs from code, and can it work cross-language? There's a... There's like an online web tool that lets you write in some source code and um, get an AST from it. And it works in multiple languages. So it's like a sort of online tool for looking at them. If you search around for online AST tool, I think you'll find it. Um, and most languages come with some sort of command line tool to print out the AST, but it's often completely different for every other language. So I'd recommend um, seeking out and trying that, uh, that cross language online tool that can print out the ASTs. And looking at the ASTs is, is useful. Um, I've said graphs are better for what I'm doing here, but um, if you're looking at some code with unusual syntax and you don't understand quite what it's doing, often printing out the AST 
can help you understand things like the operator precedence and what stuff means and stuff like that. So it's still a useful tool to look at ASTs, it's true. Great. Um, another question we have is how many of your C of nodes level optimizations do you think can be applied instead of AST level op optimizations? So the thing about the AST is it's in the name, it's a tree. So you can't have a result being used by multiple things. So if you think about the example we had where B times C was deduplicated and used once, well, that's not possible in a tree because of that's a, a graph having something produced and then used in two places. Um, and that kind of, um, so operations, uh, optimizations do that kind of thing are canonicalization and global value numbering. I know these are technical terms, but there's like a whole list of optimizations that do that. And if you can't do that, then that's pretty fundamental limitations. So that's why people don't tend to use trees. And in, in the past, compilers were only using these trees and you had things called attribute grammars and they just generated from the trees. And an MRI, the standard version of Ruby, used to interpret using ASTs. So they're still very useful, but um, it's just in reality, most production compilers get rid of them pretty quickly and put them into a graph instead because you, you can do so much more. Cool. Um, just looking for more questions. Uh, yeah, just pop them into the channel uh, if you want to ask Chris anything. Uh, but I kind of want to know uh, why this like has turned out to be your life's passion. What was it about Truffle Ruby and compilers and understanding all the nuances behind it that, that connected you? So I started working on Ruby uh, because I was told to. So I was, given <laughs> a, I was given an internship while I was doing my PhD at Manchester with Oracle. Oracle very generally funnest month. Uh, funded much of my PhD, um, but they, they said, get on a flight, come over to Silicon Valley, you're going to work on a Ruby implementation. And I literally read a Ruby book on the flight over. Um, I've been using it ever since. Um, I, the reason I like these graphs and working with these graphs is because of I just think they look really cool. Um, so I started writing this tool to draw these graphs, and I put some work into making them look a bit more attractive than the existing tools. Um, and, and people... People get told they need to learn about things like graph data structures and that they think, why? Why do I need to know about that? No one needs to know that sort of stuff in reality. And using this, I, I can show people, well, here's a real example of quite a pure graph, what a maps the, the theoretical basis of graphs quite well. And you can see how it's being used to, to run your real program. And the great thing is because everyone who's a programmer knows about programming so i can take that starting point where they know what a program is and what it does and i can say oh you can learn all about graphs from this you can learn about optimizations from this so i think you can use it to teach a lot of people quite a lot of stuff um that they can relate to and they can understand that's why i've sort of stuck with it and why i like talking about it thank you uh, for answering my personal interest question there. <laughs> Alan asks, how long do these graphs live in memory? Do they contribute to memory usage significantly? They only live while the program is being compiled. So, so the, the individual methods being compiled, so that could be just a few milliseconds or it could be up to a second for very complicated um, methods. And it does contribute to memory usage. So when I said there was like an initial investment, the amount of memory used to run something like Trough Ruby, that's because of these these graphs take up some memory as well. And it means you're representing the program in, in multiple ways at the same time. Um, because of the Graal is written in Java, and that means these graphs are fairly heavyweight as well, because each node is an actual object. If you look at previous people who have written compilers like this, they use quite a lot of low-level hacks to sort of reduce the memory consumption. And Graal doesn't do that kind of thing quite as much. The benefit is it's a very clean compiler to work with Graal, but uh, it probably does use a bit more memory than other compilers, that's true. Okay, our next question is, how does Truffle Ruby call C extensions? What are some of the challenges um, implementing support to call C code? Are, you, are there still open challenges and what about performance? So if you, people aren't aware, Ruby C extensions are where you can extend Ruby by writing some C code. And the problem with this historically is in people who want to implement Ruby differently, such as JRuby or Abinius, um, they have to meet the same API 
the same C programming contract in order to support those C extensions. So what Truffle Ruby did is in the same way as we've got a Ruby interpreter, and that's Truffle Ruby, we've also got a, a C interpreter, and that's called Sulong. It's not actually a C interpreter, it interprets an intermediate representation of C, but let's, for this, call it a C interpreter. Um, and it sounds funny to say we've got an interpreter for C, because isn't C a compiled language? Well, really, there's not much difference between C and Ruby, right? They both have if statements, they've both got while loops. Um, C's got pointers and it's got malloc, but actually Ruby does as well. It has FFI pointers and it has FFI malloc, so they're not that much dissimilar. So we can interpret C in the same way. And then if we use the same compiler, Graal, to compile both the C interpreter and the Ruby interpreter, then they can both work together and they can both interact to compile into each other to, um, to improve performance. Um, there are lots and lots of challenges here. So the C extension API expects objects to be laid out in a certain way, and we don't want to lay them out in that way because of, I would like to use more optimized representations. So what we have to do is we have to provide an illusion of the old C layout, but not actually implement that in memory. So we have this like facade layer that provides a, a fake memory view. Um, so that, that was a, quite a challenge doing that, but it works well. I say we can run a production application and its C extensions um, using this technique. So it, it seems to work pretty well. Um, performance there, we're still just in time compiling the C code. So even though we're interpreting it, we have a just-in-time compiler for that interpreter. Um, so the C extensions can run um, fast. In fact, we've seen the cases where it outperforms the real C extension. And the reason for that is because we can inline the Ruby code with the C code back into the Ruby code and MRI can't do that. Um, so in some cases it outperforms it. Sometimes it's a bit slur. Sometimes it's still quite a bit slur, um, uh, but we're working on that. Um, are there still open challenges that you're facing besides like working on performance? Is there anything major that, um, that needs um, to be worked on? The Ruby C API isn't well defined. It's just sort of whatever people choose to do. So we have to discover how people are using it and then make it work for that. Um, so there's always another C extension we find that does something slightly strange that's hard to support. Um, so. That's why it's quite a sort of iterative process. We find another gem we want to run. We have to tweak a few things here or there um, because there's such a huge volume of Ruby code out there. Uh, it's quite problematic doing this. And this is a, a real problem Ruby has long term is the fact that it's very hard to change Ruby, even for MRI, not just for newcomers like Job Ruby, because the C extension constrains them. And it, it's very hard to see a good way out of that. Um, the community's tried in the past by things like the FFI gem. But there hasn't been a huge amount of adoption, and it's not really clear what we can do to force people to use that if they don't want to. I'm not sure we can. So we have to sort of try and make do as we can by doing things like you know, quite big research ideas, such as interpreting C and using that for C extensions. But this is the great thing about Shopify and, and, and places like Oracle as well, right? If these big companies with um, some research power behind them can solve these sort of problems, and that's good for the, the whole community. Now, uh, like how big of a team is working on Truffle Ruby right now? There's only me at Shopify, and then there's four or five people, I think, at Oracle, and a few other collaborators at, at other little places. Um, but the team at Shopify was a bit larger um, until a few weeks ago when some interns left and things like that, um, and it will get a bit larger again um, when we pick up some more people. Um, so Shopify is investing fairly heavily into Truffle Ruby, and I'm part of a, a larger team where we have people working on the standard implementation of Ruby and the standard implementation of Rails and some more other ideas like that as well. Um, so Shopify is putting a lot of support into it, um, into other areas as well, which makes make sense in Ruby. Um, can you can you speak to some of those other areas that uh, change is happening? So we're working on garbage collectors in the standard implementation of Ruby. So can we take the standard implementation of Ruby as it is and improve it further? And we're using some ideas from uh, more advanced garbage collectors and trying to put them into MRI. Um, we do a lot of work to support the security of Rails and the security of Ruby as well. Um, now, 
going back to the graphs, what are some of the some of the things that people can discover, like generally, uh, by looking at graphs of their programs? Um, so a trivial thing is you can understand if a method has been inlined or not. Um, you can understand if an object is being really allocated or not, or whether it's been sort of removed and turned into a uh, something allocated in registers instead. Um, you can understand if code has been deduplicated, so that B times C, is that being deduplicated or not? Um, you can understand how the compiler understands your program and how it's thinking about it. And if something's not working in the, in the way you want it to in compilation, if you get to the end of compilation and it looks like it's doing something that doesn't make sense, um, you can look at snapshots of the graph all the way along, and you can see the point where it started to go wrong um, and figure out what optimization pass did that. And you can generally pretty easily figure out why um, at that point as well. Um, how do you how do you stop yourself from spiraling down the rabbit hole? Because it sounds like this could go pretty deep. Usually, I start with something that I know isn't right by looking at the, the final output. And then if everything's OK, I don't need to look at anything else. Um, and then if things, something's gone wrong, then I've got some sort of heuristics in my mind that I know where things are likely to have gone wrong. So I can sort of dive in and look at a particular place. Um, but you can, for example, you can just scroll quite quickly between the different versions of the graph. So you can just sort of um, you know, scrub between them and say, oh, it went wrong here. So it's not a, a non arduous process to keep looking into it. You, you recognize patterns over time. Mm -hmm. Awesome. Uh, now I have another question here. Did you evaluate using JNI or something similar to call C extensions? And was that a lot worse? What about legacy binary, which do not have C code? So we do use JNI to do the final call into real native code. So if you're using something like the Postgres library, we can keep the, the Postgres library as native code, which we call via JNI. And then when you run the C extension wrapper around the Postgres library, we can run that using our C interpreters. So we can sort of do it in a mixed mode. Um, and only code which actually uses the Ruby C API needs to be run inside the interpreter because that's the bit we need to control so we can control the layout and things like that. Um, so if you've got a legacy binary that is wrapped by a gem that you have the source code for, then that's fine. I think that's the, the most common case because if gems, six extension gems get distributed with their source code normally. So I don't think there's a big problem in the, the community of lost source code. Um, if someone's got an interesting problem like that, I'd be interested in looking at it and thinking about it. Um, but yeah, if you just have the, the inner binary is all you've got, then that's fine because the C extension there can be used. Um, speaking of like requesting information from people if they have interesting uh, problems, uh, where can people get in contact with you or learn more about Trouble Ruby uh, and all that kind of stuff? Uh, Truffle Ruby is quite Googleable. So if you go to the GitHub page, that's where Oracle maintains the master repository, and you can interact with Oracle there by opening issues and things like that. Um, if you Google Seton Truffle Ruby, then you'll find my Twitter and my blogs and stuff like that fairly easily. And people can always DM me on Twitter, and I'm always interested in hearing about uh, what people want to try. If people want to try Truffle Ruby, um, the best thing they can do is try it on a gem. So if someone maintains a gem that they know fairly well um, and they'd like to be fast on Trough Ruby, and they've got some benchmarks for us and like that, then um, both me and I presume the Oracle team are very interested in working with those people and making their code run fast. Because if someone can come to us with code they care about and they understand, then that's great because we can do the, the other half of it of making it work well on Trough Ruby. Um, Trying to run a whole large application on Truffle Ruby is a bit less realistic at the moment. I think people are quite like to get frustrated with that fairly quickly. Um, but if people have very small, for example, sort Sinatra applications or, as I said, gems, then um, definitely give that a go. And definitely speak to both me and the Oracle people. Um, there's a, an Oracle run Slack room, um, and you can get interactive support there uh, for how to try things out, and we'll be keen to do that. Um, is the goal eventually to have whole programs run on Truffle Ruby, or do you see it more as like um, used in certain situations where it'll have the maximum benefit? 
Personally, I see Trevor Ruby as the, the really big gun to bring out. So it's probably never going to be fantastic for, for example, a 500 megabyte um, digital ocean droplet or a 500 megabyte Haruka instance. That's probably not where it's going to be most suited. Maybe it will, but that, that's not personally where I see it. I think Trevor Ruby is suited for major deployments of Ruby. And because it's supposed to be completely compatible with standard Ruby, the idea is you can develop your application using standard Ruby, perhaps you can deploy the prototype using standard Ruby, but then when it comes time to deploy it and you're paying quite a lot for your cloud, then you can just switch to Truffle Ruby and Truffle Ruby will come in with its really massive um, optimizing engine via Graal and it should produce an efficient version of your program from that. That's personally how I see um, Truffle Ruby. Awesome. Um, okay, next question. So from the blog post, the compiler debug dumps are, uh, are the optimized graph data struct. And instead of converting to assembly or byte code, they want to decompile or convert back to Ruby. Do you think they're doing this better to better understand or improve the compiler or to write, write code that's more easily compiled? It's in order to understand what the compiler is doing. So the moment we look at the graphs directly, as in look at the, the actual drawings of the graph, um, and we found that looking at the decompiled Ruby code um, is much more compact and much more easy to understand. It's got some limitations because of, remember we said that we had the, putting stuff into a graph relaxed things that didn't matter. When you put it back into Ruby code, you have to artificially add back in some things which don't really matter to make it valid Ruby code. So it has some downsides. Um, so it's two tools. You can look at the source code or you can look at the graph and they're both useful for different things. If you want to know exactly how the compiler understands your program, then look at the graph because that's the, the actual data structure you're using. If you just want a general idea of what sort of things it's done to your code, you know, has it inlined it, has it unrolled this loop, things like that, you can look at the, the decompilation to Ruby. Great. Um... Now we're coming into 10 minutes uh, before we shut this down. And I know it's the end of the day for you. Do you have any, uh, oh, we have another question, sorry. Uh, oh, yes, everyone ask your questions. There's only 10 minutes left, so go make them come in. Uh, uh, are you running on the JMM, JVM or native image at Shopify and why? We're currently running on the native image. Um, by default, uh, remember I said that we were, we initially had focused on making our application work well, so it didn't really make a difference whether we ran on JVM or native. Um, we are looking at the performance of both of them, um, but it's not just JVM or native. There's actually quite a few more than that sort of degrees of freedom about what, how exactly you configure it. Um, so we're not insisting on one. We're going to look at all these degrees of freedom and what works best for our particular application. And that's really one of the strengths of Truffle Ruby in that there's quite a lot of different ways to run it. Um, people criticize Graal VM, which is the, the parent project of Truffle Ruby, saying, I don't understand what it is. Why is there so many different ways to do the same thing? But that's part of the point. And it gives you freedom to run your program in lots of different ways. And to get the performance characteristics you want, you can tune different things and trade off different things. Um, so we're looking at both, um, and we're not particularly invested in, in one as the definite way to do things yet. Um, thank you. Uh, the next question is, how feasible is it to use Graal VM's native image to produce a binary version of that application? Um, for example, cloud functions, digital ocean, droplets, Heroku dynos, uh, et cetera. So the, the context of this question is one thing Graal VM can do is it can use Graal to compile to native code. So produce a single binary ahead of time rather than just in time. And Truffle Ruby uses this to compile its interpreter to binary code ahead of time, right? So it doesn't need a JVM then. That's what the native mode means. And the, the question is why can't you ahead of time compile a Ruby application rather than a Java application to native code? Well, Truffle Ruby already does this to a certain extent in that it compiles, in Truffle Ruby, the core library is mostly written in Ruby. And when you compile Truffle Ruby, you compile that core library into the image. It doesn't produce native code to execute from the Ruby code, but I think Oracle are working on that and they're likely to be able to do that in the future. Um, and when they can do that, we could just extend it to the whole application. So you could produce it'll be like a, a customized Ruby interpreter 
for your application that also includes your application ahead of time compiled to native code. Uh, but this is research that Oracle's doing. I'm not working on this at Shopify. But yes, this is a really exciting thing that um, we're looking forward to possibly coming out of Oracle at, at some point soon. Thank you. Uh, next question is, have you considered a textual IR similar to LLVMs for recompilation? There's a lot of letters there. You may want to break them yeah. down for some people. Uh, I think it means decompilation. Uh, yeah, so we're looking at being able to output Java and Ruby and, yeah, something like LLVM and R we could. I should say that the decompilation is pseudocode. Um, you couldn't actually run it, and if you did, the semantics would be quite different. Um, so we do it as Ruby code by default because of, uh, people understand Ruby code, and that's the context we're working on in Shopify. And Ruby code is quite good pseudo code anyway. I don't know, anyone can look and understand it. But yeah, doing um, doing uh, you could even do a, like a, a well thought out standardized Graal IR textual representation if you wanted to. And um, that could be a useful thing to do, definitely. Okay, great. Um, if you have any questions, folks, let's. Uh... Put them in this will be the last call um chris if you have any final thoughts you want to put out there uh before we wrap up no please do get in touch if you're interested um if you want to learn more about truffle ruby or how to make it work for your code then we're both me and the people at oracle are very interested in doing that so do reach out and you'll get a, a positive response i'm sure and if you want to know more about how graphs work we often have uh interns here or people come and learn about this stuff here and um, teaching people about this sort of thing is a passion of mine so do get in touch great so we're going to close up now um i want to thank you chris for spending the end of your day with us and answering all our questions it was really informative um, for all our attendees, thank you for coming and, and spending this hour with us also. Uh, there will be a copy of this webinar posted on the engineering blog. Everyone who signed up will get a link to that um, video when it comes out. Um, and so don't worry about it if you missed it. Well, if you're here, you're, you, could be, you could be watching it afterwards. So um, we're hiring also, so and we're digital by default. So check um, our links and our career page and learn what's available. Um, and I want to say that we're touched by how many of how many of you joined us this afternoon. And I hope you got some instructive insights from Chris's um, discussions. And we'll be sending out a survey also. Um, after the event and we want to know how we can make it better, what kind of topics you want to hear and all that good stuff. And um, we hope to see you soon. And thank you, Chris. And thank you, everyone. Have a good day.